I will, let's deal with this controversial, this controversial subject matter. And we're going to call this um, particular subject matter um, happy marriage or gay marriage. All right, happy marriage or gay marriage. That's going to be the title of this particular subject matter. A very good article I seen and um and read in this uh, tomorrow's world. I pointed this magazine out before you might be able to find the tomorrow's world, and it's called the dangers of the cult. Right, the dangers of the cult right here. And so this particular issue from September to October, 2011. And um, just recently, and we also have our, our, Webster's, our Webster's Collegiate Dictionary because we're going to have to look up a couple of words, you know what I'm saying, so we can know legally the definition. Remember, um, this is, uh, say, a nation of laws and not men, so we need to understand the law. But in order to understand the law, we have to understand the word. And now there's a very interesting correspondence, in a sense, that goes along with this particular subject matter, happy marriage or gay marriage. At one time in America, and this might surprise some folks, but it's true. You can look it up if you are a reader of literature. You'll see it in literature that um, heterosexual marriages, that's male and female marriages, were gay marriages. I shock some folks. What do you mean? How can a heterosexual marriage be a gay marriage? That's because you do not understand, and most people don't comprehend the true meaning anymore of the word gay. Now, some may say, is this to defend the word gay? No, this is to look at the word gay in its proper context. And now when you think about the fact that spells, right? Spells are performed, right? Spell. Spell. What do you what do we spell? We spell words, right? Don't you spell words? And you've heard of the grimoire or grammar, you understand? Spells are done with grammar. You understand? You spell. You understand? It's it's, it's a trickery. It, it's it's a word game, a word play. Some say law is much like that, and on a certain level, it is, because if you present a legal case, you have to present it in a legal context according to some, some words. One thing a lot of people don't know, this is why you also hear they say same sex, you know, and they'll use gay because this is, this is the pop or the popular or the vulgaris, the vulgar to say for the mobilis, vulgaris, you know, for the, for the common folk, you understand? So we say that happy marriages, happy heterosexual marriages were considered to be gay marriages, lively marriages, joyful marriages. And this is now getting to the very root of the word. Now, the article that we, that we uh, point to here in this particular magazine and here's the let's put this down for a moment till we get in it this is called you see this right here the new normal right the new normal and that's that flag that's another reason why when we say with our ethiopian flag the banner of salvation which originally was the rainbow flag Red is not on top. That's another point to be made about red not being on top in the Ethiopian flag. As you can clearly see, it is green on top, yellow in the middle, and red is on the bottom. The exact order of the true spectrum. But now this um, so-called... Um, the the homosexual flag or the so-called gay flag is actually the spectrum upside down. It's actually upside down. If you flip that around the other way, you would have the true order of the colors. So even by looking at these particular colors, 
right? Even by looking at these particular colors, the 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 individual who doesn't pay attention to details might think that this particular flag here is that particular flag, and then another vid will probably put them side by side to show you which is which. You understand what is true from what is false. All right. Now this particular article, the new normal. I must say is one of the best articles that we have read on the particular subject matter of um, of the homosexual agenda. Let's call it the homosexual agenda, right? And recently, just a couple of days ago, it's still a big uh, controversy. Um, President Obama basically came out of the closet. You know, that's that's how they call it. President Obama basically came out and said that um, he's in favor of um, gay marriages, you understand, or same-sex marriages. Now, there's a whole bunch that's embedded in the issue, but we want to make it a little bit simple, you understand? We want to cut to the chase and get to some of the main points, if we will. So grab your pen and your paper, have a willing and attentive mind, to hear this amazing truth. So listen up, all right? Firstly and foremostly, let's put our title. Let's 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 put our title up here, right? Um straighten that out a little bit, right? Put our title up here, okay? Um we have happy marriages. or gay, right? right? Now, what's very interesting is that what does this word gay mean? Right? What's the meaning of gay? At one time, gay, G-A-Y, meant basically happy. I find it kind of interesting that you'll find some of the, either the homosexuals or their supporters in the media basically say give the so-called homosexuals the, the same rights as heterosexuals to marry as heterosexuals do um, and because once they get married they'll recognize how miserable um, you often hear that marriage is very miserable well of course if you look at the divorce rate in the Western world especially you will see that is so now what is wrong with the Western world, or should we say the Western white male um, patriarchy? You know saying the Western white male patriarchy or white supremacist world or the Gentile world. What is wrong with the Gentile world that divorces, the divorce rate is so high, and, 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 and marriage, besides the wedding, the wedding is the thing that all the women seem to want to do, or many of the women want to, you know, so-called get married. You understand? They like the wedding, they like the ceremony, the dress, the whole, you know, the whole nine yards. But then after that, you understand, the marriage is like hell. The marriage is not happy. What happened to happy marriages? Now, let's look at statistics for a moment. Right now, I'm not quoting exact statistics, but generally what I recall from my reading, my research, and what I've heard, that when we go back 40 or so years, 40 to 50 years ago, marriages were pretty much, um, a marriage in the family was a strong institution. Now we look at it, marriage in the family 40 years later is not a strong institution, and it's not one to be very desirable. People will prefer to live together, have babies together, not get married, so forth and so on, and just wing it like that. They figure it's easy, you know, they feel freer, so forth and so on. But many of us who might have attempted to do things like that, we recognize why the traditional idea of marriage is right and exact. Now, we said before when we was meditating on um, presenting, doing this presentation, 
we said before that we will begin off to say that on the issue of homosexuality, well, homosexuality is forbidden to the Beta Israel. It's forbidden to us as Hebrews, as Ethiopian Hebrews. It is living outside of the covenant. You understand? It does not preserve our birthright. And basically, it has nothing to do with our nationality. You understand? So from the Ja point of view, homosexuality is forbidden. You understand? It's even according to the Torah, it is a capital offense. Now, the truth is offense, but, the, but it's not a sin. This is something that I found to be very, very interesting. Let me, let me, let me bring it to your attention, right? Um, you recall, let's see, here we go right here. Okay, this is another document that, this is the Vayikra, right? Vayikra, right? Or the Hebrew book of Leviticus. This is where this week's, um, this month, this present space of time, we're in the book of Leviticus right now in our, in our studies. Well, I wanted to say that in this week's um, um, portion, I think it's Kiddoshim, in the Kiddoshim portion, and this has been compiled largely from um, the online Wikipedia, and it's under the Kiddoshim right there, right? Kiddoshim, right? And we go to page um, um, 320, 327. I don't know if you can see our highlight there. Maybe you can pause it. I hope you can see it. I'll read it for you, but I want you to see it right there, right? Now, this is in the at the end of the Torah portion. There are certain um, uh, books from the medieval time as well as certain documents from the modern time, certain philosophers and authors and, and researchers, past and present, are referred to or quoted. So when we're studying our Torah portion, there's additional research or information that if one is interested in, one can go and research and, and study and compare. And in this particular portion, which um, constitutes this uh, week's Torah portion, constitutes Leviticus um, chapter 19, verse 1, to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 27. That's in the uh, Kedoshim portion, um, or holy ones, saints, holy ones, Kedusan portion. It contains two major items, the laws of holiness, the holiness laws, as well as the penalties for transgression. Now, if you have studied this particular portion, and we go into the, um, the, the, this portion here, the, the penalties for transgression, where Jah had told Moses to instruct the Beta Israel of the following penalties for transgression. Transgression of what? Transgression of the Kal Kidan, transgression of the Benai Berit, transgression of the covenant. You see, um, it speaks about these were the following to be put to death, and I'm going to read through these right here. These are the these are the capital crimes, right? The capital crimes. One who gave a child to Molech, one who insulted his father or mother, a man who committed adultery with a married woman, and the married woman with whom he committed it a man who lay with his father's wife and his father's wife with whom he lay, a man who lay with his daughter-in-law and his daughter-in-law with whom he lay. This is in Leviticus chapter 20, if you want to um, just reference it. A man who lay with a male as one who lies with a woman and the male with whom he lay. A woman who married a man who married a woman and her mother, and the woman and mother whom he married, 
a man who had carnal relations, that is to say sexual intercourse, with a beast, to say an animal, and the beast with whom he had relations. A woman who approached any beast to mate with it, and the beast that she approached, one who had a ghost or a familiar spirit, in other words, one who is a medium, in other words, for the dead. Now, all of those that I just read, and the one in particular that concerns um, homosexuality is in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, a man who lay with a male as one who lies with a woman and the male with whom he lay. Now, people might say, that okay, that's, yeah, that was Old Testament, that was the Bible, and some would say, well, in, in, in Christ there is no more law. You might have heard that particular lie, but brothers and sisters, it is a lie. The, the law contained in ordinances which covered the sacrificial, sacrificing animals on behalf of sin was done away with, with the perfect sacrifice of our black Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, of the black Christ of Yeshua HaMoshiach. And it's very clear if you can read and have reading comprehension, it's there in the scripture. And many who have studied it, you know what I mean, from all different races and perspectives have come to that conclusion from studying the scripture. If your pastor or preacher tells you that the law is done away with, you tell them that they are a liar. Specify. It's the law that was contained in ordinances or the law that covered the particular sacrificial ordinances. So no more bulls or goats sacrifice, no more cruelty to animals. You understand? For Ainaz Rastafari, this also becomes an incentive and even a justification for not eating debtors or animal flesh. You understand? Not eating animal flesh, since the whole institution of animal flesh can be connected with the whole act of sacrifices. So no more sacrificing an animal for the sin of man, but each one must become a living sacrifice in Christ, you understand? And through Christ. So that's a little bit theological there, but we thought we'd touch on it because there's a lot of dissemblers out there who will fool you if you're not learned in this particular word and in the truth contained therein. Now, the interesting thing that we notice, I read that right there and I showed you this highlight right here because there's a particular work right here from Jacob Milgram. And the question, quote, does the Bible prohibit homosexuality? Does the Bible prohibit homosexuality? And here's the answer. The Bible or the biblical prohibition is addressed only to Israel. Did you hear that? This biblical uh, prohibition against male homosexuality was addressed only to Israel was only addressed to the Beit Israel. We can prove, I mean, that can be very easily proven. It says, speak to the children of Israel. It doesn't say, speak to the Romans. It doesn't say, speak to the Greeks. It doesn't say, speak to the Europeans or speak to um, the Mongolians or whatever like that. It doesn't say, speak to any of those people. It says, speak to the Beit Israel, the Bani Yisrael. Speak to the children of Israel. This is very important. Now, many of, many of us, we knew this. In fact, just before preparation for this, particular, for this particular presentation, I was looking through the section again, and then I saw this down here and said, wow, ain't that something? And it says, it is incorrect to apply it on a universal scale. It is incorrect to apply it on a universal scale. Now, this is very very important. Who are the children of Israel? And who are the racial seed of the children of Israel today? We, the once lost but now found, so-called Negroes, blacks, and coloreds who have been given false imposed European names, Smith, Jones, and, and Johnsons or Jacksons, 
you understand, who have been told, you understand, that that we have no history before slavery. When we come down to really learning the roots about ourselves, and this is a good opportunity once again to, you know, present some of these. We have um, From Babylon to Timbuktu. Is that the website? From Babylon to Timbuktu. You understand? This basically expressed who were the slaves brought over to this Western Hemisphere. Who are they really? Or who are the main group of this people? Because other tribes also, not all black people in America are Israelites. We, we need to really understand that. But the ones who are called, who are chosen, who recognize and return into the covenant and, 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 and reclaim the birthright, reclaim their birthright, and, and reclaim their nationality as Ethiopian Hebrews, yes, those and these and we are the Beit Israel, and this is our divine heritage. This book also, um, The Valley of the Dry Bones, I've mentioned this before. This speaks about the conditions that face black people in America. This is by Rudolph R. Windsor, a very, very good book. These books will provide you the historical, the factual, the, in some cases, very detailed information that you will need if you do not know your heritage, your true heritage, as the once lost but now found Beta Israel. Now, when it says right here in this book by Jacob Milgram, because some of the books here actually speak um, um, towards um, um, various issues contained in the portion, and um, it's very, very interesting. Of course, there's different views. You understand? Um, there's there's uh, different views that are that are put forward. But we thought that 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 particular view right there was very interesting. Does the Bible prohibit homosexuality? The biblical prohibition is addressed only to Israel. Is only addressed to Israel. This is this is the key thing that a lot, many of the Gentiles misunderstand and misapply, and then they misidentify who are the true Beta Israel as well. It is incorrect to apply it on a universal scale. So we thought that that was particularly very interesting in this particular document, and. Like we said, before we found this clip, this, this portion here, we was going to basically say that, of course, the Rastafari view on homosexuality, you understand, as a practice is that it is an abomination, you understand? And if we were in jurisdiction, you understand, if this law was in jurisdiction, we do not have brothers, and please listen to this word, because sometimes we'll see Bati boy or Bati man, and we'll say, Chan, we'll do this or do that. We are not to commit extrajudicial um, acts, you understand, without authority, or to presume authority of the King of Kings to act in such a way. For self defense, if it's really a, a self defense issue, if, 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 if a Bati boy is you know, a sodomite or homosexual trying to rape you and you're defending yourself, or well, that's like any other situation where someone is seeking to defend themselves. But if the Gentiles or the lost sheep are participating in that activity, please note, and let me give you scripture on this, because scripture needs to be used, you understand, for those who have faith in the glory of his majesty, the, the true and the faithful rise to far who have faith in the glory of his majesty. It says, um, it's very interesting because it actually speaks to, you know, that those that want to be holy, right, let him, you know, let him, here we go right here, uh, chapter 22, which is the last chapter in 
of the book, Revelation. It says, chapter 22, 22, 11. It says, it says, uh, he that is unjust, that means not righteous, not right with the king of kings in his Christ, in Jesus Christos, in Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Allow, let him be unjust. Be unjust over there. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to let him be unjust in your house, in your home, whatever you have um, um, authority over, whatever domain you have authority that belongs to you in, in, in spirit and in truth. You know, like if this is my house, you understand? Know I don't have to suffer such activities in my house. You understand? So one can still exercise that human right as well as that divine right. So he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, he which is filthy, he, which, he who has corrupted himself, it says let him be filthy still. Let him remain um, corrupted. And he that is righteous, he that is right with the king of kings and his Christ, or in and through Yeshua HaMoshiach, in and through Jesus Christos, our black Lord and Savior, let him be righteous still. And he that is, here's the key operative word, he that is kedus, he that is holy, it says, let him be Kodesh, Kiddus, let him be Kiddus, let him be holy, let him be set apart for Jah and for Jah's service. Let him be set apart still. Now, it's interesting because um, there's some definitions on righteousness that, that needs to be understood as well as some definitions of sanctification. And here at the footnote on sanctification or holiness, the summary is this. One, in both testaments, in both the old, the Louis Kidan, and in the new, the Hadith Kidan, the New Testament, the same Hebrew and Greek words are rendered by the English words sanctify and holy in their various grammatical forms. The one uniform meaning, there is one uniform code, there is one uniform meaning of holy and sanctify, as well as consecrated, you understand? And the one unified meaning is to be set apart for God, to be set apart for Jah. So when we speak about Ionized to be holy, Kedus, Ayla, we're to be set apart for Jah. You understand? That means set apart in his covenant for his work. So if others out there, you understand, know want to be this or want to be that, why does that bother you? You understand? Why are you going to allow that in emotionality? Oh, there's a bati bai. Now I'm going to do something to that bati man. Do, are you doing the King of Kings service? It's not to say fire bun, fire. You understand? And just keep it moving. You understand? Because if you're set apart for Jah, you must be on Jah's work. Did Jah send you to do that? That will contradict his word, his glory, the witness of the King of Kings, the witness of the Jesus Christus, and the witness of I and I. So you will be in violation. A word to the wise should be sufficient. You understand? A word to the wise should be sufficient. Now, secondly, in both testaments, the words are used of things and persons. So both things can be caduce. Things can be holy as well as persons can be set apart for Jah, set apart for God and for God's use. Thirdly, when use of things, right, no moral quality. When use of things, there's no moral quality concerning things. This is interesting. When the word holy is used, it's not a, with things, there's not a moral qualification, with people, that is different. They, the things are sanctified or made holy because they are set apart for Jah. If I say, this is for Jah, you understand? Even in the world, it may be one thing, but if this is now made holy with oil or with, or with prayer or with a word for Jah, so be it. So the things do not have moral qualifiers. Let's understand that. 
the things do not have moral qualifiers. It's like saying the computer. The computer can be used for good or the computer can be used for, for, for evil. But if it's set apart for Jah, that's set apart for Jah's use. The thing itself is not moral or amoral. It's just set apart for Jah's use. Um, there's more to the point about holiness, but I think that holiness is very, is very, very important because in covenant, you understand, living within the contract, living within the covenant, we as, as true and faithful, as the mitmanon, we as the, the sons and daughters of his imperial majesty, we as the Ethiopian Hebrews and the Beit Israel have to recognize this, these are basic building blocks, basic foundation. Now, of course, you know, we're in a reason right here about gay, right, and happy. Because we want to first of all point out that there is a an agenda going on here. This particular article right here basically talks about what this so-called new normal is. And now, what what's very interesting about this article? If you don't have the opportunity, perhaps you might even scan it and put it up as a PDF because it, it has some pretty good information. It basically helped at least me to recognize. How this whole, you know, we see all this happening so very fast. You know what I mean? It, it, it's like if you think about black civil rights, it's like black civil rights stopped after, after King got shot and killed and murdered, assassinated. After Dr. King got shot, boom, civil rights was gone. Really, for the most part, you know, they talk about firm tax, they talk about a lot of stuff, but the real movement was gone. We see this so-called homosexual movement, you understand, continuing to, to vampire, suck the blood of black people and say, oh, it's just like when the black people couldn't get married to a white person. Oh, it's just like the black people, it's just like black civil rights, just like black people, stop that. We have to tell them, stop that. Why don't you say it's just like the Jews in Europe and the Holocaust, you know what I'm saying, or the Jews being persecuted in Europe by the Nazis and the Holocaust? Why don't they say it? they know there will be a backlash, even though many so-called um, um, uh, European Jews, you know what I'm saying, not many, but there are some who might be homosexual, you know what I'm saying, even they would find it a little bit, uh, come on, a little bit, the, the two are separate issues. You know what I'm saying? One was speaking about the Jews, and this was speaking about a homosexuality. But they continually point to, oh, it's like the black. We was listening to some Sunday morning news shows, and they did it again there. And they didn't have a single, not even just a black person, but they didn't have any person to really speak and check that particular. Well, I, I, I will refrain what I'm about to say, because there was one particular man who was going to face the nation. He said something very interesting. What he had said was um, he spoke about something called, I want to put some of these notes up here so if we don't get the chance in this particular recording to go through all of it, we'll build up and, and carry on. What you can do is look up some of these things. First of all, look up what gay means. Look up what gay. We did that look up of what gay means, and let's share this with you while we have an opportunity. I think we had actually marked some of these some of these pages here, and the word gay, right? The word gay. Um, Middle English guy derived from Old French. Then they, they put a question mark, or maybe Frankish, gahi. It means swift, impetuous, akin to the German um, ja or ja. I said, what? You understand? The German ja or ja. Now, notice this right here. I mean, I, I, I got to show you this because some may not, right, some may not um, believe it, you understand? So you can see it right there. I don't know if it's, it's blur, but you can see it right there. Look it up in the Webster's third edition. So anyway, um, I guess it's ya ja because the J in, in Germany is like a, a Y sound, but it's spelled like J-A-H. Now, the first... Um, Connotative meaning, the, the first item is joyous, or first entry is, will be joyous and lively. So gay meant to be joyous and lively. 
merry, happy, lighthearted. Merry, happy, lighthearted. See, this was the original meaning of this word. This word has nothing to do with any particular sexual preference, you understand, or inclination. And um, it, it, it had to do with heterosexuals, heterosexual marriages that were happy were considered to be gay marriages, and it had nothing to do with any homosexual activity. But now this word has been twisted. You understand? It's like, it's like, it's like um, calling good, bad, and bad, good. Things have been flipped. It's almost like a spell. You understand? It's like a, a, we're under a spell. We're living through some sort of spell, a confusion in words. So now you cannot even use the word gay. The word gay is not even used in its proper context anymore. You see, this is nothing to do with a homosexual person who wants his homosexual rights, and if his law tells him he has rights, he has all the rights to go for whatever rights he has. But now, for him to take a word kind of out of English use and to say, we own this word, and we're going to use this word like we like, because the word basically means, if you said to most folks that you are gay, they're going to think that you're homosexual. Yeah, and you might say, no, I'm, I'm joyous and lively, I'm merry, I'm happy, I'm lighthearted. I'm not heavy-hearted, I'm lighthearted. Then the, then the second, it says bright, brilliant. I'm bright, I'm not, I'm not dim, I'm not, I'm not dull or without light. No, I'm bright, I'm brilliant. Thirdly, it says given to social life and pleasures. I socialize. You understand? And pleasures, you don't have to take pleasures in a negative connotation because a social life means one is social. After all, this is a society, is it not? So a society must have social, some sort of social activity. All right? Um, then when we get to the fourth one, it begins to t turn. The fourth connotation begins to turn. So we, we're up to four now, and we're now getting a spin on the word, on the usage of the word, um, the colloquial, as it were. It says wanton, wanton, right? A licentious. You understand? That means overly inclined to some, some immoral sexual uh, desire, lust, or activity. Then it says a gay dog. You understand? A dog that's wanton. You know, like a, it's interesting they had a gay dog here. You know, this is very interesting because I thought it's a way. A gay dog and the, and the, and the so called homosexual people didn't have problems. Like what I remember growing up, you know, that the dog, you understand, would kind of, you know, one male dog would jump on another dog if it's a male or female, or whatever, because it was like in heat. It didn't care. So maybe that's the idea now that's being twisted. But it's interesting that they say a gay dog. Then the fifth one has a star next to it. Very interesting. It has a star next to it. It says A, homosexual. B, of, for, or relating to homosexuals. Then it has an example, gay liberation. You see that? Gay liberation. Not homosexual liberation, but gay liberation. Then as a noun... The word gay as a noun now. See, that was gay more as an adjective. Now, gay as a noun is a homosexual, especially a homosexual man. Especially a male homosexual is called gay. But as an adjective, it means joyous, lively. So... When we hear this idea of gay marriages, what they usually do is this. They'll insert right here, same sex. And then they might go a little further. Remember, even here they don't include the woman. Later on, later on they'll say gay and lesbian. Gay and lesbian. You know what I mean? But then they have others, the, the, the bi and the transgender also in that, I guess you call it a civil rights type of a class. It's a 13th, 14th artificial, you know, artificial person class, law, speaking of law. Um, so the word gay as an 
adjective, it means to be joyous, to be lively, to be happy, happy. This is why we said that prior to the 60s and the 70s, more like the 70s, happy marriages between uh, opposite sex, male and females, were considered to be gay in the sense of they were considered to be happy. Now, of course, that's in the, right, the, ad, the adjectival sense. Of course, that's as the adjective. Now, when you say gay as a noun, well, that now is said to mean referred to a male, quote, homosexual. But since both the gay and the lesbian are homosexuals, why don't they call it homosexual marriage? They say same sex, which I guess is another way of um, qualifying it. But be that as it may, I thought it was very interesting on the on the face face the nation show when they talked about what Obama said, how he finally came out for a gay president, rah rah rah. That um, they talked about the statistics. They said 40 states in their um, I guess uh, 40 states in their legislatures basically have upheld the so-called traditional definition of marriage as being between a male and a female, between the opposite sexes or between the hetero sexes. They said six states. There are six states, I think, and D.C., perhaps that would make the seventh state, so to speak, or the capital that has statewide or state recognized um, homosexual marriages or 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 same sex pseudonymously gay marriages, right? Then they have three states which are debating it. Three states which are looking at what's going on just recently. There was another, I forget the state that um, some, somewhere maybe in the South that basically reinforce, you understand, the traditional male, female, or the natural law. Basically what they affirm is what is often known and called as, which was the next thing that we wanted to put up here. We want to speak about, put it right here, natural law. Now, it's important to understand this. Let's see, do this right here. This is important to understand this particular word right here, natural law. You understand? Natural law comes into the legal, you understand? It comes into the legal language. And what's interesting about this particular subject matter as, you know, as we grow in our um, knowledge of ourselves and application of the of the principles um, and uh, um, reclaiming our birthright, our, our name, our birthright, our nationality, as we work towards reclaiming our own sovereignty, is that we come across in the law natural law. So we need to define natural law because one of the um, individuals on on Face the Nation, basically he argued not against um, homosexuals or, you know, as Americans or whatever. We have, to, we have to admit that as American in this jurisdiction, in this system, you understand, they have the right like any other person not to be deprived um, extrajudiciously of their life. You see, now, of course, there may be some, even Rastas and others, who might think otherwise that they have been given jurisdiction, but you have to overstand the law, you understand, if you are going to um, be in the glory of his imperial majesty. This is why we study Torah, right? But that being that, natural law, what is natural law? So let's look up right here and bring natural law, you know what I'm saying, let's bring natural law um, forward, all right, so here we go right here, natural, let's go to natural law, so 
under natural law, it says the one rules of conduct supposedly inherent in the relations between human beings and discoverable by reason, law based upon man's innate moral sense. Secondly, a law of nature. And it says, see law in the sense of, it says in parentheses, 8a. Thirdly, the laws of nature collectively. The laws of nature, of nature collectively, right? Now, it is interesting when you understand the application of um, natural law, when you understand the application of these aspects, even towards our um, declaration of our uh, sovereignty. You know, we speak of our sovereignty, reclaiming our name, reclaiming our birthright, declaring that I, the natural person, you see, declaring I, the natural person, is based on this natural law. You see what I'm saying? Now, you have artificial law. You see, you have artificial law. And not to get into too much detail here, some of y'all may be familiar with it, some of y'all might not, but the 13th and the 14th Amendment and being a Negro, black, or colored, carrying false, artificial, superimposed um, um, European names, such as uh, Smith, or Jones, Johnson, or Jackson, if you please, um, these are all examples, legally speaking, of artificial person, of artificial persona. So you have the natural law and the natural person, and then you have the artificial, you know, saying law and the artificial person. As ironic as it seems, you know, saying the civil rights, legally speaking, did open the way for such things as so-called gay or same-sex marriages. It, it did open that based on arguing artificial law. You understand? Know artificial law. You see? And the artificial person. You understand? Know the artificial person. You know? Not speaking about natural law and the natural person, but the artificial person is not truly in law the artificial person is really an outlaw. That's why they need the government, you understand, to affirm their rights. In other words, the government is the government is like their how can we say? The government becomes almost like God in a sense. The government issues and declares their rights. That's not how government truly is formed. The government truly is formed because we, the people, you understand, sovereignly and freely give a certain amount of right. We give that right and authorization. But truly, the government does not have the power to give rights. But we've gotten in that process legally in America, and so that's a whole big I'm going to say long argument, but there's much details to that particular matter. Now, in speaking about happy marriages or so-called gay or homosexual marriages, I hope you understand right now that the true meaning of the word gay has been taken out of its true context. You understand? has been taken out of its true context that marriages heterosexual marriages that were lively, that were joyful, that were happy, that were healthy, were considered to be gay or happy. This idea of gay marriages, you know what I'm saying, is really, in essence, another example, because we just talked about feminism a little bit earlier, it's another example of the white male land-owning gentry you understand? This is why you, you hear them say gay and lesbian.
but it's like even the lesbian so-called is a second, you know, is, is, is like a second citizen. Interestingly enough, the Bible specifically, you understand, um, within Torah does not point out um, a death sentence, in other words, to the lesbian as it to, does to the male homosexual. We're just speaking law, Old Testament, as a part of our, um, we could say, Torah ju jurisprudence, so to speak, getting into the science of it. So I wanted to bring that particular matter forward and to kind of connect, if we would, some of the dots concerning this particular um, issue. Now, there, there's, there's, there's much more to this that we want to touch on, including this particular article. And like I said, this particular article actually tells us a lot of how this all came about. In fact, this, this one area, if you would, let me just share this with you, all right? Let me share this one area. Let me put right here um, uh, natural person. It's very important to understand why we are connecting this particular issue when we speak about our sovereignty, about reclaiming our birthright, about living in contract or living in, in covenant, understanding the law, that under natural law, we declare ourselves the natural person. If we do not declare ourselves the natural person and we come under these artificial statuses as Negro, black, colored, and then if we, if we continue to use slave masters' names, you know, his European names, his false names, and then turn around and claim that we're African-American, you understand? So we say we are part, quote, African, and then we still are using slave master and plantation names. You're not under natural law. You are not a natural person. You are an artificial person. You are a 13th and a 14th Amendment creation, part of the whole Emancipation Proclamation, which made over the slaves as property, not of the plantation slave masters, but of the federal government. And this is one of the processes that we get the birth certificate. And very interesting with the birth certificate, if you check it, it is connected to commerce. You know what I'm saying? It's connected to commerce. You see what I'm saying? In other words, it's about the money. Very interesting with the whole um, gay agenda, the so-called homosexual, homosexual agenda, a lot of that with the whole marriage, same-sex marriage thing. We saw Susie Orman on The View, caught a clip of her on The View, um, and she was speaking everything about the federal rights, that how um, heterosexual people, you understand, or heterosexual marriages, traditional marriage, and they, they have so many more rights than so-called um, um, gay, lesbian, same-sex so-called marriages, you know. And the rights so-called that they have all deal with financial, deal with money, whether filing taxes, so forth, and so on. Then we heard the very same person speak and say, well, it's not about money. It's about we want to join you. We want to join with. It started to sound really strange. It really, really started to sound strange. From what we heard, it was basically about the money, the ability to so-called adopt children, that you remember years ago, many used to say, well, this whole homosexual thing, it can't go far because they can't have children. Well, it seems as though the homosexual agenda, they heard that, and they immediately started to respond by these sort of um, adoptions by same-sex people and these stories that we often hear in the news to basically condition the people. But where does this come from? Here's where it comes from, and, and prophecy comes alive. And in this particular issue right here of um, Tomorrow's World from September to October 2011, under an article called The New Normal, and may I share some of this with you? The New Normal, it speaks on the homosexual agenda. 
It says the rise of the rise to prominence of homosexuality and same-sex marriage in Western nations did not just happen because its time had come. Rather, a careful analysis shows that it is a small minority of activists who have driven the issue. Reliable studies confirm that no more than 2% of the population identifies in any way as homosexual, yet their influence has been magnified by a relentless campaign to change, change you can believe in, to change the minds of, quote, opinion leaders, end quote, in Western society, all right? Interesting? Listen up. About 20 years ago, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen, these are names that we don't hear about. You know, because I was wondering, you know, we wonder, how did all this start? You know, you hear this, you hear that, but you know when you hear the truth and you get a sufficient amount of data, you say, yeah, and then you study it, you check it out, and you just find more that verifies one's initial, you know what I'm saying, one's initial um, um, opinion, you know, or one's initial conclusions as you get more data. And when we read this article, we said this is a very, very good article because it's accurate, it's not demonizing so-called homosexual movement or whatnot or the so-called gay bashing, whatever. But what it is doing is presenting the truth in a sober, in a, in, a, in a logical, rational, but also a biblical way, and even a compassionate way to say, listen, you understand? As human beings, we all have fallen short. But truth is truth. Do not lie against the truth. That's the key. Because when you lie against the truth, you are left in your own fantasy world. You understand? And this is largely what, what's happening now. This is why most folks cannot see the forest for the proverbial trees. But it was about 20 years ago that one named Marshall Kirk, Marshall Kirk, ever heard of his name? And Hunter Madsen, ever heard of Hunter Madsen? These are two individuals whose names are very important. They've played a very pivotal role in this movement. But do you know how? Here's how. These two Harvard University educated homosexual activists, Harvard, didn't President Obama go to Harvard? Was it Yale? Harvard. Okay, they developed these two, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen, that they developed a plan to use the power of social marketing and public persuasion tactics to challenge and change fundamental Western views and values. The strategy they mapped out in an article titled The Overhauling of Straight America and in a book, After the Ball, How America Will Conquer Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the 90s, is now commonly known as the homosexual agenda. This is the homosexual agenda, right, that was planned out by Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen two Harvard University educated homosexual activists. So it's not just that they were homosexuals, but they were pointedly homosexual, no pun intended, homosexual activists. You understand? And they developed their plan to use the power or the influence of social marketing, we call it social media today, and public persuasion tactics to challenge and change fundamental Western views and values. So they mapped out a strategy um, in an article. One article is called The Overhauling of Straight America. Here's the, here this article, The Overhauling of Straight America. You understand? In other words, just the straight people going about their business, you know what I'm saying? None of these people are accused of committing crimes against gay or homosexual people. You understand? And when you look at the history of things, 
you know, you begin to recognize that these so-called gay or homosexual people, to some extent, have existed in many different societies, you understand, and many different epochs, you know, going back in time. You go back to the Roman times and the, and the so-called Greek times. However, whenever the so-called homosexual agenda became successful in a society, we, we learned this with Rome and we learned this with Greece. A lot of folks like to, you know, the, the homosexual activists and scholars, they try to debunk this, you know what I'm saying? But there's still a whole lot of information out there that basically proves that whenever the society came, uh, evolved or devolved, is it evolving or has it devolved? You understand? Devolved to such a level, the society you understand, was in danger. And with all the different signs of the time, I think this particular sign is very key, is very pivotal, because it says in the last days that that one would seek to change laws and times. You understand, change laws and times and, and even stand up against the prince of princes. That means stand up against our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach. King of Kings, even, right? The essence now of this so called homosexual agenda, what is it? Well, this particular article right here by Douglas S. Um, um, Windnail, Douglas S. Windnail, very well written. If you check this out or whatnot, um, Tomorrow's World People, this is thank you very much. Well researched and well informative article that explains to us that the essence of that agenda, the homosexual agenda, is to portray homosexuals as sympathetic victims, to portray as villains those who oppose homosexuality, to redefine homosexual conduct as normal and even desirable. Sound almost like the whole tree in the Garden of Eden thing and to recruit political and financial support to overturn laws that constrain homosexual conduct. You know, and remember, this article is written in 2011. Even from what we've seen from then to the present time to Obama just this past so-called weekend, no pun intended, coming out as he did, you know, this is all just lines up. Everything just lines up. Just a little bit more. Now, Kirk and Madsen, they describe their agenda as follows. So Kirk and Madsen, these two Harvard-educated um, homosexual activists, they describe, right, the agenda. They're going to describe the homosexual agenda. Quote, the campaign we outline in this book, though complex, depends centrally upon a program of unabashed propaganda. They make no shame about it. A lot of propaganda, just think about all the stuff you've seen in the media and in movies and you read and just in society all over. You understand? Know it was unabashed propaganda, a programming firmly grounded in long-established principles of psychology and advertising. So uh, psychology has been used. It's, it's like America for the past 40 or so years has been totally psyched out. You understand? Remember the whole psychedelic? Maybe that's how that, that, that began. You understand? Through that whole psychedelic so-called so movement because so-called um, um, drugs, you know, pharmaceutical and meth and all this kind of crazy stuff while... You know, why you can drink until you're drunk, you understand? Know but they still want to fight against the cannabis, you understand? Know the cannabis or the cannabis. But this was an after the ball, right? This is in the, the after the ball book on um, page XXVIII or page um, 28. At the same time as public health officials were growing concerned, about the rampant spread of acquired immune deficiency syndrome, Kirk and Madsen, they saw AIDS as an incredible public 
relations opportunity. So while the AIDS thing was going on, these two Harvard-educated homosexual activists, they said, listen, this AIDS thing is an opportunity. Quote, where's our quote? Quote, how can we maximize, they asked the question, how can we maximize the sympathy and minimize the fear? They set about on the campaign to maximize the sympathy and to minimize the fear. How, given the horrid hand that AIDS has dealt us, can we best play it? And this is in the very same book. Actually, it's one page before on page uh, 2028. What we are seeing, brothers and sisters, what we are witnessing, in America and other white Western European Gentile nations, it is a result or a consequence. You no, know, well, a result. The consequences are coming. It's a result of a deliberate attempt, a deliberate attempt to change the perspectives and values of nominally, that means in name, basically, quote, Christian, end quote, peoples through the power of advertising and persuasion techniques or psychology. We can even call this mind control, perhaps, right? But just concluding this, as Kirk and Madsen wrote, quote, we mean conversion of the average American's emotions, mind, and will through a planned psychological attack in the form of propaganda fed to the nation through the media. They say this on page 153, 153. Now, how interesting is this? This is actually being put in a book, which is the homosexual agenda that I think was, 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 was written roughly some 20 years or so ago. They basically say that we're going to use propaganda, plan psychological attacks, attack in the form of propaganda fed to the nation through the media. So they would use the media, you understand? They would use the media for this program of unabashed propaganda, firmly grounded in long established principles of psychology and advertising. How very, very interesting. So what we're seeing today is the result of that. You understand? A continuation, even an escalation with the new media forms that we have is an escalation. Now, this strategy has allowed these radical ideas to gain acceptance in schools, universities, churches, courts, and political parties in recent decades. Now, that is just from this portion right here. I just read just this portion right here. You understand? Just, just a portion of this. There's, there's a little bit more to it, but this portion right there, it, it, it gave me a concrete understanding. It answered even a lot of those, um, you know, those kind of gut feelings. You're like, something's up with this. You know, you, you start to pick up things, you understand? But then you're like, okay, am I just seeing this? And then you get to recognize that the ones that actually planned this, they, they wrote a book, they published a book, and the book was called After the Ball, How America Will Conquer Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the 90s. And then they wrote another book before, or article before that, The Overhauling, The Overhauling of Straight America. It's like somebody says that, well, you straight? We want to change your straightness. We think your straightness is the problem. You understand? We think your straightness is... I mean, I mean how, would you like, how would you like that? You understand? Isn't that, in a sense, almost like a violation on a certain level? Isn't it a violation? It may not be a, a, a physical attack, but that might make it that much more worse and even more pernicious and dangerous because it's not a direct physical attack. So you're being attacked. 
you know what I'm saying, when you're watching the TV, when watching the media, because some ideas are purposely, you understand, being put forward. Now that you know this, hopefully your eyes will be open to see this. There's much more on this particular issue, but once again, the word gay, you understand, at one time, heterosexual marriages, good, lively, joyous, happy heterosexual marriages were considered to be gay marriages. It had nothing to do with um, uh, gender and gender, same-sex gender politics or propaganda or any of that. You understand? It just had to do with natural law, natural persons being happy, hopefully, you know, because it's, 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 a, it's a sad day for marriage and, and for family. You understand know because of, of 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 the corruption. You understand? Know I mean, I mean, the deception where the Bible speaks about how Satan has had deceived. You understand? Know He's a deceiver. You understand? Know millions are are being deceived, and it's like the secular world has completely lost sight of the fact that there are indeed satanic forces that are operating in the world. The Bible reveals that Satan is a, is a liar and the father of it, that he is a deceiver who deceives the whole world. Satan uses lies. You understand? He had used lies to deceive Adam and Eve in the Ganetta. 